optimal minimal. At this altitude, I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start shaking. Can I answer your personal question? Now we're just in a perfect time. What if I did the opposite? I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over a metal endoskeleton. This episode is brought to you by Peloton. I love Peloton. Peloton is a cutting-edge indoor cycling bike that brings live studio classes right to your home. You don't have to worry about fitting classes into your schedule, making it to the studio, or dealing with some commute to the gym. I have a Peloton bike in my master bedroom at home, and it is one of the first things that I do in the morning. I wake up, meditate for 20 minutes, and then I knock out a short 20-minute ride, usually high-intensity interval training or HIT. Then I take a shower and I'm in higher gear for the rest of the day. It's beautifully convenient and has become something that I actually look forward to. And I was skeptical in the beginning. I didn't think I would dig it. And I really do. So (laughs) you have a lot of options. For one, if you like, you can ride live with thousands of other Peloton riders from across the country on the interactive leaderboard to keep you motivated. I tend to use a lot of the classes on demand and have four to six of them that I've bookmarked and use over and over again. There are up to 14 new classes every day with thousands of classes on demand and there are a variety of workouts to choose from 45 minute classes 20 minute burns hip-hop rock and roll low impact or high intensity pick the class structure and style that works for you peloton has an amazing roster of incredible instructors in new york city they really do have great instructors of every possible personality (laughs) and style and you can find one that you love no matter what you're in the mood for personally i use matt wilpers a lot but i use a bunch of them i'm promiscuous and enjoy classes from a lot of their instructors with real-time metrics you can track your performance over time and continue to beat your personal best i did not think the gamification would work for me and uh, they really hit the nail on the head It does work, at least for me, tremendously well to keep me pushing consistently. So, discover this cutting-edge indoor cycling bike that brings a studio experience to your home. Peloton is offering listeners of this podcast a limited-time offer. Go to OnePeloton.com, that's spelled O-N-E-P-E-L-O-T-O-N.com. Enter the code TIMPODCAST, all one word, at checkout and get $100 off accessories with your Peloton bike purchase. Get a great workout at home anytime you want. Go to OnePeloton.com and use the code TIMPODCAST to get started. This episode of The Tim Ferriss Show is brought to you by 99designs. 99designs is a global creative platform that makes it easy for you to find an amazing designer and create designs you'll love. From logos, to branding, to packaging, to books, you name it, they have it. And I've used them for just about everything. 99designs is the go-to creative resource for any budget. I've used them for years now for book covers, for instance, mock-ups of The 4-Hour Body, which went on to become a number one New York Times bestseller, illustrations for the multi-volume Tao of Seneca, including the cover, and many other creative projects. I've been very impressed by the quality of their work. Most recently, I used 99designs to update the illustrations and layout of my 5 Morning Rituals ebook. The illustrations worked out great. I loved working with the designer we selected, and I plan to work with him on more projects in the future, and that's something you can do. You don't have to start from scratch every time. And right now, my listeners can get $20 off plus a free $99 upgrade on their first design contest. Simply submit a brief on the site describing what you need, and designers who are interested in your project, often from around the world, will submit concepts for you to choose from. You refine as you go, give feedback, and once you're ready, you choose one to finalize. It's a great way to get started and find the right match. A great designer and a great design at a great price. So head to 99designs.com forward slash Tim to learn more or get started today. You can also see examples of some of the work that I have done with designers on 99designs. So check it out, 99designs.com forward slash Tim. Hello, boys and girls, ladies and germs. This is Tim Ferriss, and welcome to another episode of The Tim Ferriss Show. I'm very, very excited for this episode and my guest because he's had such a tremendous impact in my life, and I haven't seen him in quite a long time. So let's just jump right into the bio, which does not quite do you justice. We're going to dig into some things that have been artfully omitted here. Ed Shao, Shao spelled Z-S-C-H-A-U, who is currently, among many other things, interim president of Sierra Nevada College, which is a pro bono assignment he's accepted. (laughs) 
Much, much earlier, he founded System Industries in Palo Alto, California in 1969, and as its CEO, led it to a successful IPO in 1980. In the 1990s, he was the general manager of the IBM Storage Systems Division headquartered in San Jose, California. I believe that was, what, a $6 billion business, something along those lines. And we'll come back to that. Ed has a total of 10 years of teaching experience as a professor in the graduate business schools at Stanford University and Harvard University, and he has taught high-tech entrepreneurship courses for a total of 22 years in the engineering schools at Princeton University, Caltech, and the University of Nevada, Reno. In addition to serving on the boards of major public companies such as Reader's Digest and StarTech, Ed has helped to start and build several technology companies during the past 20 years, some of which were founded and led by his former students. And I've met many, many of Ed's former students who have started and built tremendous companies. In the 1980s, Ed represented the Silicon Valley area of California for two terms in the U.S. House of Representatives, serving on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Also during the 1980s, he was a general partner of Brentwood Associates, a venture capital firm, and he was the founding chairman of the Tech Interactive, which I lived very close to back when I was in California, formerly known as the Tech Museum of Innovation, a nonprofit educational institution in San Jose, California. Ed holds an AB degree, cum laude in philosophy, bridging with physics from Princeton University, as well as an MBA, MS, statistics, and PhD degrees from Stanford University and a Doctor of Laws degree, honoris causa, hope I'm getting my Latin correctly, from the University of San Francisco. Currently, he is a senior fellow of the California Council on Science and Technology. You have three children, nine grandchildren, and I'm going to leave out your exact resident specificity just because of the size of the audience. Ed, welcome to the show. Oh, it's great to be here with you, Tim. Uh, I think back to the spring semester of 2000 when you contacted me after all of the other students had registered for my course and made such a, uh, an impressive plea to be able to enroll in the course. Uh, committing, if you were enrolled, that you would clean the blackboards, clean the erasers, do whatever it took to make my life easier. And uh, I almost cried when I <laughs> heard uh, those words, and uh, you took the course, and I'm so proud of what you've done over the past 19 years. I don't... Uh, blame the course for your success, but I, I do blame uh, your enrolling in the course for our friendship. And you've taught me so much from the very beginning. I, and I, I, I wanted to take the course for many, many reasons. This was ELE 491, High Tech Entrepreneurship, which was in the Electrical Engineering Department and the ORF Department, which I can never remember uh, the, the actual full name for, Operations and Research Operations, Finance. Operations, Research, and Financial Engineering. There we go. Now, I have, I have no business whatsoever being in any engineering school, but uh, at the time, the, the, the Princeton courses, undergraduate courses, were only very recently being voted on by students. This was a very new thing. This was before Yelp and so on. And one of the standouts was this new course, High Tech Entrepreneurship, uh, taught by Professor Xiao. And I, I really wanted, like many people, to be part of this course. And when I, when I finally was accepted to the course and um, began learning. I remember at one point I was cleaning the blackboard and cleaning the erasers. And you said to me, I don't know if you remember this, you said, Tim, don't get too good at cleaning the erasers. <laughs> and uh, there, was, there was a lot of direct teaching and a lot of indirect teaching, just observing you as you interact with your students and the world. And there, there are certain things that uh, you know, when I describe you to my friends, and I do that very often, and uh, a lot of your students, I mean, you were just telling me before we began recording, stay in touch with you. And these are people from 40, 50 years ago. Uh, it's, it's, it's remarkable. And one of the things I throw in that was not in the bio I read was figure skating. Uh, could you please tell us about your background with figure skating? Well, I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, and we were fortunate to have uh, an indoor skating rink 
where uh, a professional ice hockey team played. Uh, the Omaha Knights, they, they were uh, probably a farm team for one of the NHL uh, hockey teams. And uh, my mother took me to that ice rink when I was about seven years old. And uh, I really enjoyed the challenge. And I remember coming back from one session when I was just beginning to skate. And I, I said, Mom, I, I really had a good day today. And she said, well, what was so special about it? And I said, I only fell 40 times this, <laughs> this time. <laughs> and from what you might call small beginnings, I began to get more proficient and more interested. And in those days, uh, figure skating was really figure skating, where there were precise patterns on clean ice with turns and loops that you had to uh, perform in order to pass certain tests. And I passed the pre-test, and then I passed the first test and the second test. And at that point, I was kind of on my way, but ice was only available during the winter. So I, when I was 13, I began spending summers away from Omaha where there were ice rinks and continued to train and continue to pass tests. And uh, when I was 16 years old, I had passed the sixth test, and I uh, qualified for the national championships in men's singles in a, a lower group, not the, the world-class group, but a lower group. And um, I was also ice dancing with a, a, a partner, and in 1956, we won the silver dance championship in the midwestern sections there were three sections in the country went to the national championships and then the my senior year in high school 1957 again i skated in the national championships in in berkeley california i never was a winner but um, it was a special experience to meet a lot of people throughout the country going to these championships. And I still stay in touch with my dance partner and uh, a gentleman who I competed against uh, in uh, uh, the singles championships. It was a big part of my life, Tim. And, and as I think about it, the hours that I spent training, getting up at 6 a.m. or actually 5.30 a.m., being on the ice in Omaha at 6 a.m. in a cold winter, Nebraska winter, and then skating in the evening to fitting in homework uh, school uh, to prepare for one competition where if you did well enough, you could go to the national championships. It taught me a, the power, the value of uh, practice, uh, of dedication, of persistence, uh, and um, determination. Those are valuable life lessons and character building lessons. So when people ask me, well, how do I prepare to be a leader or to uh, change the world? Uh, it's through learning those values, you don't get a, a quick return creating value for the world. You get a quick return doing something that doesn't matter. But um, if you're going to make a difference in the society, changing the world for the better, you better be prepared for a long journey. You, to me, as, as one of your standout characteristics have preparation you, you have you have very meticulous preparation i remember this because uh keep in mind people listening as as we said i was showing up to potentially do my chalkboard duty and my eraser duty and so on so i would arrive to ele 491 early and you would be arranging the name cards so you had placards for the students which is not common at princeton so you'd have you'd have the name cards you'd be arranging chairs and uh, reviewing potentially the uh, case study materials. And I don't remember 
any TAs, any teaching assistants for that class. So could you talk about how you've thought about preparation outside of, say, figure skating? And did that come from your parents? Where did that attention to detail before the competition, whether that's a competition in business, sports, or otherwise, or just getting up in front of a class of students, uh, can you talk to where that comes from and how you think about preparation? Uh well, I was a, a strong believer in Murphy's Law. <laughs> Whatever can go wrong will go wrong. <laughs> yeah. And so um, I would come to the classroom typically 45 minutes early, make sure that the projector was working. Uh, I didn't want, and, and sometimes it wasn't. Yeah. And so I w- had time then to call the uh, audiovisual people, and they'd come over and uh, get it fixed, rather than showing up right at the time the class starts and then finding that there are problems that uh, disrupted the flow of the of of the class. Uh, I think it was Benjamin Franklin who wrote, "Failing to prepare is preparing to fail." <laughs> and and so it, it, it's it's very important to me not to be surprised by things that go wrong. And the way that you prevent that is through preparation and making sure everything is the way that it needs to be for success. As far as the class is concerned, even though I had taught uh, the lessons, the sessions, many, many times, I usually spent two to three hours prior to each class preparing again um, I, I viewed my classes, which were taught by the case method of teaching and learning, where uh, students would read about an actual company situation and put themselves in the position of the uh, CEO or the founder or the technical person and describe what to do. I would ask questions and they would uh, give the answers. And um, I felt that 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 approach to um, teaching and learning, putting someone in the, the the position of the of the founder or the person who had to achieve the results, rather than just listening and learning and reading from a book, would uh, not only help to to learn but also build the confidence that uh, they could do that. Uh, kind of job. Well, in order to make that experience, that classroom experience work the best, it was like a performance. Yeah. I would I would come in and uh, I didn't know exactly how the discussion would evolve, but I knew the lessons that would come out of it. And I'd find a way, regardless of what the students would say, to convey those lessons through their words. And the the case method is is something I'd love to talk a little bit more about because my first exposure to the case method was in your class. And it's a method that, uh, as as I understand it, is is used at Harvard Business School, uh, also at Stanford Graduate School of Business. What I also found so appealing about the case method is you'd, as a student, have these these short modules, these case studies, and they would often be a part one with a cliffhanger, right? So the so the module one would end with some type of dilemma or disaster or a big decision, and you didn't have the conclusion. You didn't you didn't have the answer, meaning what actually happened in that particular case. And it allowed you to think for yourself, but it also gave you an opportunity to speak to the class, to speak to you, and to be assertive also, right? Because you would have, I remember, at least in my, in my class, many differing opinions, some of which were polar opposites. And uh, it's it, it really struck me as a, as a pragmatic way to allow people to be active in the way that they're going to have to be active if they're ultimately going to be entrepreneurs. Yeah, when uh, you're teaching and learning 
about starting enterprises or creating something new, uh, you learn by doing. And so it, the case method helps in that. Projects that are real help uh, do that. Uh, one of the Princeton graduates, uh, three, oh, it's now four years ago, wrote her senior thesis on can entrepreneurship be taught? <laughs> or is it something you're born with? And there are articles that have been written that um, college courses in entrepreneurship are a waste of time. They don't matter. So in 2015, when she was working on this, I uh, created uh, an online survey instrument which I sent out to all 1,600 Princeton students that I had had in my classes over 31 semesters. And uh, we had to cut off the responses in order for her to meet her thesis deadline after 400 responses of the 1,600. But of those first 1,600 responses, 160 had been founders of companies. And uh, among the survey questions was the question, what Princeton experiences have helped you in choosing your life path and succeeding in what you pursued? And of the 160 founders, 95% said it was the course that made the difference. And um, I think what it was, it's not so much what they learned in detail, but rather pointing out to the students that this is a possible life path, that you can create something from scratch and create value. And, and what great satisfaction you get from that. It also, and I attribute this to the case method, gave... Uh, students the confidence they could do it. They'd read the case and say, I'm as smart as that person. I know I could do that too. And I tried to choose the cases with youthful uh, founders rather than old people like me. <laughs> and uh, then there were some tools, that techniques that they learned from it. But uh, I believe that everyone is born with the desire to do something beyond themselves. And as an entrepreneur, uh, starting something from scratch, making it real, uh, impacting the world in that way, uh, it fulfills that desire to do something meaningful beyond themselves. Is that what uh, an entrepreneur is to you? I mean, if you were to define entrepreneur, is that someone who who built something from scratch, whatever that might be. How do you think about the term entrepreneur? Well, you probably remember this, Tim, from <laughs> the course, but uh, I assert that entrepreneurship isn't about starting companies. Entrepreneurship is an approach to life, and you can be an entrepreneur in anything. It's about starting something from scratch. It's about making good things happen that hadn't been done before. It's a combination of innovation, a lot of people get ideas, and implementation. And that second part, implementation, is the most important. A lot of people say, wouldn't it be neat if we could do this? And that's as far as it goes. But entrepreneurs say, wouldn't it be neat if we could do this, and then they do it. <laughs> so, so I want to say a few things and underscore a couple of things. The first is that there are only two courses I still have all the notes from, uh, meaning courses, classes I took as an undergrad that I still have three ring binders, uh, that, uh, which contain all the notes uh, from. Uh, one was The Literature Effect with John McPhee, and the other was ELE 491. So I still have all of those notes. And uh, it, it strikes me that 
well, first from a uh, just from a tool perspective, if if people want to find uh, case studies that are used at places like Harvard Business School or Stanford Business School, you can actually find quite a few online and, and order them. So I, I would encourage people to look into that. Uh, the reason that I have notes from those two classes is, I think, in, in large part because. I had, and we were talking about this a little bit earlier, a very, very difficult and dark period in my life uh, junior year and took some time off of school. It was a very, very hard time for me. And what I found in uh, the literature of fact and also uh, particularly in high-tech entrepreneurship was a, a teaching and reinforcing of optimism, right? which is very different from giving all of your students rose-colored glasses. You were showing that, and I found this to be really personally very helpful, in these case studies, a lot of things go wrong. <laughs> but you were able to show how people figured it out and how they learned to navigate around those things. How do you think about, if you do, the role of optimism in any of this? Well, I'm a chronic optimist. And... Um I believe that that is important to doing things that haven't been done before. You can imagine all of the things that can go wrong, and I guess there's some value in being a realist, but uh, I don't think you do things that haven't been done before and succeed in that by being negative and focusing uh, act, uh, on the, all of the things that uh, need to be done. Rather, it's having a vision and then committing to making it real. And uh, I was blessed that way. I, I just look at the world. I don't think through rose-colored glasses. No, but I, I don't think so. When, when people say that's going to be hard, I say... That, it's going to be more fun then because doing something that's hard is a lot more fun than doing something that's easy. <laughs> How did you, uh, well, I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask two questions. So I'll start with the, the one that uh, I should probably ask first, which is when you were, say, 20 years old, 15 or 20, somewhere in that range, what did you think you were going to be when you grew up? What did, what were oh, you? I knew exactly what I was going to be. All right. At that, I was going to be a physicist. Uh -huh. And uh, I came to Princeton uh, in 1957 uh, with a plan to uh, major in physics. And then in my sophomore year, I discovered philosophy. And I thought, this is way cool stuff. And I decided that I would major in philosophy with, in those days, what was called a bridge program with physics. So I took all of the required courses in physics, uh, and, but my department was the philosophy department. My independent work, both as a junior and senior, were on subjects that combined philosophy and, and physics. Uh, my senior thesis was uh, describing what the German philosopher Immanuel Kant's theory of space and time would have been had he been born 50 years later and had known Einstein's general theory of relativity. And I described in my thesis, if, uh, this is what Kant's theory of space and time would have been. Unfortunately, uh, he, he didn't know general relativity. He based it on Newtonian physics. But as a um, presumptuous 21-year-old, <laughs> I figured I knew what was inside Kant's head. And if he'd just known about Einstein and, and his theories, uh, he would have had a different philosophy of space and time. <laughs> That and uh, $2.40 will get you a cup of coffee at your favorite coffee shop. <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned Einstein. I mean, the, the, Princeton certainly has a storied history in some respects with, with physics. Uh, I mean, Einstein spent time 
not not too far away from where we're sitting right now, and uh, Richard Feynman and others, certainly. Uh, is that how you ended up focusing on on Princeton and physics? It was was the was the the history? I guess at that point, uh, I'm not sure what specifically would have drawn you here, but is that what drew you to to Princeton? Well, starting from the time that I was about 12, I was uh, an Einstein. Uh, lover, I guess you'd say. I began reading about uh, his theories and biographies and, uh, and so forth. And so I uh, applied to various colleges uh, in the physics department, engineering physics in one case uh, and physics in all the others. And I was accepted to all of those schools and all of them provided me with a uh, rather attractive scholarship, except Princeton. Princeton uh, wrote to me and said, uh, you can work in the dining hall as a busboy, and uh, I think I could make with 12 to 15 hours a week $400 a semester. And I chose Princeton because I concluded that must be the toughest school. They're not making a big deal out of me. <laughs> and I want to go where it's most challenging. Uh, I've never looked back. Did you end up finding Princeton challenging? Oh, way too challenging. <laughs> and uh, at, at that ended my figure skating career. Uh, I did not have the time to continue to um, practice. I tried to compete in my freshman year in the Eastern Championships and didn't do that well, and I began to realize that I wasn't going to make it. And looking back, I don't know whether I would have ever made the world team, but in 1961, many of the uh, skaters that I had either competed with, trained with, my skating coach, all perished in a plane crash. The world team on their way to the world championships in Brussels, Belgium in 1961. And we lost a whole generation of uh, world-class figure skaters. And I don't know whether I would have ever gotten to that point, but I'm glad I made the choice that I did to go to Princeton, to give up figure skating, and to focus on what's led me to be here talking to you. When did teaching enter the picture? What to, what did you, what happened after? If you could just paint a picture for us after your your undergraduate experience. Well, I knew what I was going to do after I graduated from Princeton. I uh, had applied for and was accepted to the U.S. Navy Officers Candidate School in Newport, Rhode Island uh, to begin my training in September of 1961. Uh, I went back home to Omaha, Nebraska, worked in manual labor on the night shift in a can factory, uh, and in late August was called to Fort Omaha to be inducted into the U.S. Navy. During that uh, pre-induction interview, I was asked if anything had happened to me health-wise since uh, I'd applied in February and had it physical then. And I said, well, I broke my leg in a rugby game at Princeton in April, but it's fine now. Uh, they didn't take my word for it. They ordered an x-ray and concluded it wasn't up to Navy standards. So I was unable to enter OCS in September of 1961. Uh, very disappointed. Uh, I did have an alternative. I had uh, applied to Stanford Business School for the MBA program. I only applied to Stanford because it only had one essay in the application, and all the others had three. So um, I, I focused on, on Stanford for that reason. I had been accepted, and I never sent in the postcard uh, that uh, indicated that uh, I was not coming. So I retrieved the postcard, sent it in, and within, oh, I'd say six days, 
my whole life changed from going into the Navy to going to California and entering the MBA program. I did not know in that split second in April when I heard a crack when I, f I fell in the rugby game that that would change my life so dramatically. And that's why I tell people who ask me about career planning uh, uh, that career planning is overrated. You asked me the question, though, how did you get into teaching? Well, I was uh, in the MBA program at Stanford University, and there, just like philosophy at Princeton, I discovered operations research, applying mathematics to real operating business problems, but operating problems in general. And I said, this is way cool. And so rather than looking for a job as I was approaching my MBA degree, I applied for the PhD program to pursue operations research. And after my first year in the PhD program, the uh, professor who had taught the most popular second year MBA course, electronic data processing, it was the only course at Stanford Business School at that time that had anything to do with computers. He left unexpectedly. And uh, I went to the dean of the business school, and I said, Mr. Dean, you have a problem. You've got 100 <laughs> uh, second-year MBA students signed up to take Business 366, electronic data processing, this September, and you don't have anybody to teach it. I am the solution to your problem. <laughs> I can teach that course. And they said something like, don't call us, we'll call you. And in late August, about four, three weeks before the course was to begin, I get a call. Ed, can you teach that course? I said, you bet. And that's how I began my teaching career. Again, there's a life lesson here. Uh, opportunities unexpectedly happen. And many people say, gee, that's an interesting opportunity. But it only matters in life if you seize the moment, if you take advantage of that opportunity and commit yourself to do something that you've never done before. I find that I learn the most the fastest when I don't know what my, I'm doing. <laughs> and, and so I'd never taught a, a university course, and all of a sudden I'm in front of a, a hundred second-year MBA students, 24 years old, <laughs> teaching a course. But I did okay, and then uh, Stanford Graduate School of Business said, would you teach another course? I taught different courses, and that's how my teaching career began. How did you become good at teaching or study teaching, refine your teaching? How did you, how did you work on that? Because um, you're an excellent teacher. There are plenty of bad teachers out there, uh, plenty of passable teachers, even at incredible institutions, but I would consider you a, a very, very adept teacher. How did, you, how did you learn to teach? I think I became a better teacher by not being smart. And here's what I mean by it. Uh, people who are really super smart, uh, learning comes too easy. I believe you can be a better teacher when it's more difficult for you to learn so that you can explain to somebody else how to master some lesson. Uh, I, was, I also um, had the chance as a high school senior to take a course in debate. Uh, it was a full year course in debating. And that helped me with public speaking. But more importantly, uh, the um, high school teacher who taught debate 
uh, also uh, taught the various individual events like uh, oratory and uh, extemporaneous speaking. And I um, wanted to compete in extemporaneous speaking. What is, could you just uh, define what that, what that means in this context? Yeah. So, well, this is the way it was uh, in, uh, when I was in high school. An extemporaneous speaking contest, a, uh, each uh, participant individually would be given a topic on which to uh, speak for 10 minutes. And uh, they were, each contestant would have one hour to prepare the 10-minute speech. So th my high school teacher said, well, come in after uh, school's over every afternoon, and I'll give you a topic, I'll give you an hour, and then you come back and give your 10-minute speech on that topic. So the first time I did that, uh, he gave me a topic. I spent the hour preparing. I gave my talk, and when I ran out of words, uh, I said, is the 10 minutes up yet? And he says, it's only been three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but every afternoon, he would do that. And uh, by the end of the public speaking events that year, the contest that year, I'd become a, a state champion in extemporaneous speaking. You asked earlier, Tim, about preparation. This is just another example. I wasn't born to be a speaker. I wasn't born to be a teacher, but I learned to do both. And there are tools also, as you, as you mentioned in your own teaching, there are tools that you can give people and strategies, which is certainly part, uh, was part of ELE 491 in, in my case, and in the cases of, of your students. With the extemporaneous speaking, what were some of the, what were some of the uh, keys to getting better? Were, what, were there any techniques or strategies or ways of thinking about the topics you were given? that were particularly helpful? Uh, yeah, I, in that final uh, event, uh, I remember the topic. It was, what was the significance of the conflict between Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton? And I had a an hour to prepare that one. <laughs> Before Google. Before Google. <laughs> and, and so um, the style of presentation, it wasn't a sort of matter of fact. It was to prepare what might be called a 10-minute oration with drama, with stories, with uh, life lessons, and sort of end on a crescendo. And um, let's go back to teaching. Uh, I view uh, teaching more about nurturing, about personal values, about inspiration, about recognizing that you can have fun doing great things. And um, it, it, it's not so much what the, the, the lessons or the facts, but rather it's, it's building, a, I, maybe even contagion, uh, uh, this optimistic attitude and understanding that if you can change the world for the better, you're, it, that's, that, that's as good as it gets. Yeah. I, I do think the... Uh you know, in retrospect, it's maybe easier, well, of course, it's easier to see in retrospect, but how these various chance opportunities and encounters with philosophy, with the teaching, with the extemporaneous speaking, not necessarily in that order, but how they've combined into this alchemy that has enabled you to transmit and infuse these beliefs to your students in a way that is very, very memorable, right? It's not just the text in the book. Uh, what do you remember? I mean, you remember the topic, Aaron Burr, 
and so on. Do you remember any of the choices that you made in, uh, in how you competed with that um, competition? Oh, in, in speaking? Yeah. No, I remember uh, my debate partner at, uh, in high school and then at Princeton. He was one year behind me. We had started kindergarten together, and then I skipped first grade, so I was one year ahead of him. Uh, but when he was a junior and I was a senior, he... Um, uh, we were debate partners in a debate team. There were two on each side, and one uh, you were assigned whether you were uh, the affirmative speakers uh, behind uh, and uh, supporting the resolution or the negative speakers uh, against the resolution. And <laughs> I remember he was the uh, first affirmative speaker. And uh, I was sitting near while he was standing, and he got confused, and he gave the negative case. <laughs> and I'm sort of making hand signals to him <laughs> as he's giving the negative case against the resolution he's supposed to be speaking for, and I was going to have to follow up on this. <laughs> and he finally realized what was happening and he was so smooth he said and that ladies and gentlemen is what our opponents would lead you to believe <laughs> however <laughs> and then he quickly switched to the affirmative case that's incredible <laughs> but there's also a lesson in this that Things sometimes don't work out exactly the way you plan, but you've got to adapt and figure out how to segue into what will work. See, you, you strike me as very, very adaptable in so many ways. I mean, you've, you've spent time in so many different worlds, uh, and you're very good at seizing opportunities. Uh, but you've also done certain things for periods of time. You've, you've run companies for extended periods of time. Uh, you were in politics for, for, for an extended period of time. Uh, how do you, this is actually some phrasing that I heard from Rabbi Jonathan Sachs in the UK. He said, uh, you know, op, how do you differentiate between opportunities to be seized and temptations to be resisted? So when, because there's a, you've, you've, you've focused for extended periods of time on single things when no doubt there are other opportunities being thrown at you. How do you think about focusing for extended periods or opening yourself to opportunities? Uh, this is really a simple uh, question. Uh, and it's answered with one word, commitment. Uh, I, I had situations where I had opportunities to leave uh, uh, companies that I was running. I would not leave until it was appropriate to leave, where there was a successor, there was success. Um, when you're an entrepreneur and people are investing in you, when you're an entrepreneur and a CEO and employees and customers and suppliers are counting on you. Uh, you've got to have a commitment to do the job until you're no longer necessary. When I took the company public, my first company public, and it was about a a ten year period, and there were times during the, that ten years where we almost went under. But when we had gone public and I could, and then did a secondary financing so there was sufficient capital, and then did a search for a successor, I felt that then I could leave to run for the Congress. Perfect segue. Why, why did you decide to run for Congress? I thought I could be good at it. And, and here's why. It wasn't just, uh, gee, that's way cool, like philosophy and operations research. Uh, in uh, 1977, uh, I was on the board of directors of the American Electronics Association. 
And uh, electronics companies during the 70s were uh, unable to raise sufficient amounts of risk capital. Uh, the amount of uh, capital committed to professionally managed venture capital funds during the 1970s, funds that would be investing in tech companies, was only 50 million a year. Wow. 50 million a year. <laughs> And uh, I was asked to chair a task force for the American Electronics Association on capital formation to figure out what to do. And I assembled a group of entrepreneurs and investors, and we concluded the single um, inhibitor to sufficient quantities of risk capital investment was the high rate of the capital gains tax at the federal level at that time, which was 50%. Uh, and looking at it, if an investor invested and uh, lost money, uh, they lost all the money. If they invested and made money, they gave half of it to the federal government, forgetting about what they'd have to give to the state government. So we felt that lowering the tax on capital gains was essential to stimulating the environment for risk capital investment, not just for electronics companies, but all kinds of job creating uh, ventures. And um, the, the task force put together a white paper and usually that's the end of the story. That, well, we've <laughs> uh, proposed the lowering the capital gains tax. But keep in mind, Tim, that this is a group of entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurs don't just talk about it. They make stuff happen. And uh, so the first thing we did is we did a survey of our the electronics industry and documented the importance of more risk capital investment for job creation and for the ability of these companies to get started and grow. Uh, then I went to uh, Washington and testified before Congress and there was a young congressman from Wisconsin, Bill Steiger, who was on the House Ways and Means Committee. and. Uh, he became intrigued with this idea of lowering the tax on capital gains, and so he introduced a bill to do so. And I worked with him and my uh, the whole uh, electronics association uh, worked in lobbying the Ma Ways and Means Committee, uh, worked with the uh, Senate, and by November of uh, 1978, about. Uh, a year after we'd started this process with our survey, uh, the federal tax on capital gains was lowered from 50% to 28%. And within uh, about 18 months, $1 billion of capital flowed into professionally managed venture capital funds compared to the 50 million a year that had been happening during the 70s. And anybody who studies the 1980s, that number on an annual basis, uh, four or five billion a year flowing into uh, uh, funds that were supporting new enterprises and job creating enterprises. So that experience, particularly because Bill Steiger died of a heart attack within a month after this bill was passed. In no he passed away in early December of 1978. The bill was passed in November of 78. Uh, his example inspired me to for public service. He had changed the nature of the debate in Washington on tax policy from who pays and who doesn't to what will be the economic impact. And uh, I felt, gosh, somebody who has built a company, somebody's had the experience that I had with working with Bill Steiger to get the tax uh, rate on capital gains reduced, perhaps I had a contribution to make in public service. It also strikes me, and I think you may have even said this in an interview that I read in preparing for this conversation, 
that in uh, in a very real sense you had uh, an advantage in the sense that you could always go back to building companies, right? It, it, which means you weren't necessarily dedicated to being a politician as a career indefinitely from that point forward. You had very you had some attractive plan Bs or plan Cs if it didn't work out. So it, did that uh, enable you to think more aggressively or differently? Well, I, I had a, a, a personal uh, principle that uh, I was only going to stay in the House of Representatives at most three terms, six years. Um, and that gave me uh, two advantages. One, a sense of urgency. I couldn't just kind of wait around and, and uh, learn the ropes. I had to start making a difference as quickly as I was able. And secondly, it gave me the freedom to do what I thought was right. Uh, the worst c could happen is I get retired, or maybe it's the best that could happen. I get retired <laughs> after one term or two terms. Certainly, I wasn't going to serve more than three. As it turned out, I only served two terms in the House because as a congressman from California, I think there were at that time 48 or 50 California members of the House of Representatives, and um, we were a dime a dozen. <laughs> we're just, and it was very difficult for a single California uh, congressman or congresswoman to uh, get the message out. So I felt that uh, if I have ideas, uh, I not only need a message, I need a megaphone. And I decided that I could get a megaphone if I became uh, a U.S. Senator from California. Uh, I ran for the U.S. Senate in uh, 19, uh, started in 80, uh, 85 for the 1986 campaign. I won the Republican nomination uh, but I was defeated in a very close election, about a percentage point, percentage point and a half by the three-term incumbent, uh, Alan Cranston. And um, looking back, I was disappointed at the time because I felt I wasn't as good enough candidate. I had lots of support and I'd let people down. But uh, looking back... I dodged a bullet with that very close loss because uh, since then I feel through leading companies and through, at least my view, changing lives for the better, my students over many, many years, that I may have through uh, not just their lives, but how they've changed in a positive way the lives of others, that I may have made more of a contribution to a better future than I would have as a U.S. Senator. I believe that. <laughs> I definitely believe that. Uh, and, or I shouldn't say and, but at the time, uh, you were disappointed. And I would be very interested to hear, because we've been talking about a lot of uh, your successes, and you've had a lot of successes, but at that time, when you got the news that you had lost, uh, what did the next few days or weeks look like for you? What did you What do you say to yourself when you when when you have uh, when you experience a loss like that? Uh, what do I do next to make a difference? And um, I'd never been out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you think about it, it, it was from teaching to starting a company to running for Congress, and now. I was, I didn't have a next, what am I going to do next? And uh, I had the opportunity to join the venture capital firm uh, that uh, was the lead investor in my first company. And I uh, accepted that assignment as a general partner of the firm. 
Uh, it was Brentwood Associates at that time was a Los Angeles based venture capital firm. And uh, I established the Silicon Valley office of that firm. Uh, I think they, my uh, partners would agree that uh, I wasn't really very good at uh, being a venture capital investor. Uh, I'm too much of an optimist. <laughs> Every deal I looked at, oh, gee, that, that's really interesting. That, I can see how to make that happen. And as a venture capitalist, you really have to be more realistic and maybe even super critical. Um, but also at that time in my life, um, I viewed being an investor as kind of like a football coach. Uh, you walk the sidelines, you send in plays, you make substitutions, you rant and rave at halftime, but you never put any points on the board. And I was still, uh, in at that time in my life, wanting to put points on the board, meaning running a company, not being the better in the stands, but the jockey on the horse. And so when I had an opportunity to become CEO of one of the companies Brentwood had helped to start, uh, I, I took that opportunity in a company in the magnetic recording components business called Sensor. How do you make, uh, what is your decision process like for something like that? Because you, you mentioned with the venture capital general partner position, perhaps you were too optimistic. Everything sounded interesting. But when you make a decision to, say, become the CEO of a startup in the portfolio, you're saying no to other things, presumably. So what was the decision process like in evaluating that and saying yes to it? Well, it's, it's, it's again, commitment. I mean, I was part of a firm general partner of a firm that had made a, a significant investment in this company and they felt that there was a need for uh, a new CEO. And so um, when uh, they talked to me about it, it started out as, well, can you go in there and help out and be on the board and... Um, it evolved into, can you go in there and run it? And I wasn't going to say no to my partners. Did you, in your mind, or explicitly with them, set expectations in the way that you did for yourself uh, with the three-term limit as, uh, as a congressman? Did you go in to it saying, I'm, I'm committing to this for X period of time and then we'll reevaluate, or was it left totally open-ended? Well, I was left open-ended. Uh, the goal is success <laughs> rather than how, how long. And um, I think you're getting to a, an issue that where I may not be like a lot of other people. I don't do things for me. I do things for others. So if you want to get down to what motivates you, Finding something that I think is meaningful that needs to be done and recognizing I can help do it. And it's not about the money. That's why I do things pro bono. Um, my wife is not particularly thrilled with that approach. <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, uh, I, I, it's... I focus on where can I make a difference for the benefit of others rather than what's in it for me. And um, I don't know whether that's unusual, uh, but um, it served me well. How do you uh, differentiate between the things that will have the greatest impact for others and feeling peer pressured to commit to something, if that question makes any sense. Because it, it, seems, like, uh, it seems like people pleasing and committing to things that will help the greatest number of other people or deeply help other people are two different things. And I guess I'm, I'm just wondering if, if there are times when you commit to, say, doing certain things because the general partners to whom you've made a commitment ask you to do it, 
may not always be the same thing that will have the greatest impact. Uh, maybe it's not a good question. I'm just wondering if you've ever run into a position where people want you to do one thing and you could be very good at it, but you feel like your, your abilities are better put in a different place. Yeah, usually the, the decisions that I make about how I'm going to spend my time and my life are, are uh, made by me rather than responding to requests. Uh, when I uh, came to offer my course here at Princeton, I hadn't gotten a phone call saying, hey, Ed, would you please come and teach a high-tech entrepreneurship course at Princeton? Rather, in June of 1997, I asked for a meeting with the then dean of the engineering school, James Way, uh, and in that meeting, I proposed uh, that the engineering school would benefit from having a rather comprehensive program in entrepreneurship. Uh, it, it just made perfect sense to me that engineers innovate, but in order to make a difference in the world, that innovation has to then become real and commercialized and often in a startup venture. So exposing engineering students to that process and that opportunity seemed to make sense. And that was the origin of the first offering of ELA 491 in the fall semester of 1997. Uh, again, a, an instance where uh, I decided that there might be some value that I could create. And now um, Princeton, entrepreneurship, the Princeton way is pervasive across this campus with many courses, with many uh, co-curricular and extracurricular uh, programs for the benefit of student entrepreneurs. And uh, the survey that I mentioned before, out of 400 of the students that took my course, forgetting about or not including the courses, the many other courses that are now offered, uh, to have uh, 160 founders of uh, companies from that cadre, it would suggest to me that out of the total of 1,600, that there may be three, 400 uh, founders. And I still, Tim, I'm uh, touched when I get emails from students I, I may have had a dozen years ago uh, saying, Ed, um, you planted the seed 12 years ago, and it's finally sprouting. I've just founded my first company. It took me this long, but um, you gave me the confidence to do it. How have you thought about parenting and your own kids? Because you're, you've, you're so deliberate in how you teach and you've prepared so extensively, not just for the courses, but for each individual class. How have you thought about parenting? Uh, or how would you describe your parenting style? It's, it's almost the same. That, um, it's just that the students start a lot younger. <laughs> um, I believe that um, the best way to help people find their way, nurture them, is through encouragement, rather than direction. Um, but when I was, um, when our children were young, and we have three children, I coached 13 soccer teams uh, with um, all three of them played soccer at one time or another. Uh, I was a Cub Scout leader and a Boy Scout uh, leader. And um, the, we're really proud of the way our kids turned out. Uh, we were lucky. Uh, they were growing up in a good place at a good time. Uh, probably not uh, a lot of the challenges that uh, all parents face today 
with uh, the world more complicated, uh, with uh, communications technology more advanced, um, but um, uh, loving them, uh, caring, and letting them know that you love them and you care is, is kind of the secret of parenting. Could you speak to the encouragement instead of, rather than direction, uh, a bit more? Does that mean that you're exposing them to a lot and whatever they gravitate towards naturally is what you then try to foster? What, what does that mean when you say encouragement instead of direction? Uh, well, they've got to live their lives. You can't live their lives. <laughs> and uh, I think I benefited a lot from my own parents. They were proud of me, whether I did well or not. Um, I learned uh, when I was maybe five, six, seven years old how to build radios and build uh, motors in the basement workshop from my father who had a degree in electrical engineering. But sadly, uh, during the Depression, he lost his engineering job and got into a... Uh, a, an assignment that really didn't have anything to do with engineering, but he stayed in it in order to provide for his family. Uh, one thing that I remember from my parents, uh, I was, as we talked about earlier, a competitive figure skater, and sometimes I didn't do well in a competition. I may have fallen, I may have not done a school figure uh, very well, not up to my ability. They never criticized me in those situations. They never put pressure on me. Uh, they were always uh, supportive and proud, uh, regardless of how well I did relative to what I could have done. What might they say, let's just say, on the car ride back after you've had, for you, a disappointing performance? What, what, what are the types of things they might say to you? Great job. <laughs> Great job. And, and having been a soccer coach, um, I know that not all parents act that way. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes parents are the problem. <laughs> the players are just fine. <laughs> parents are a problem. Uh, but um, both of my parents weren't raised by their parents. My uh, mother was raised by her grandmother. My father was raised by his mother's sister. Uh, his mother died when he was about 12 years old. Uh, his father was in the German newspaper business in Montana, but... Um, he, he and his sister grew up in Omaha, raised by his deceased mother's sister. And I think as a result of their not having parents, they wanted to be the best parents. And so my sister, uh, we n never had a whole lot of money, but my sister had ballet lessons, and she was an exquisite ballerina. I had piano lessons and uh, figure skating lessons. And uh, they just wanted to be the best parents ever. Um, and I think they felt blessed to have two children who wanted to succeed. You know, we both studied hard. We were both good students. We went to college, we did other things besides that, and, and we wanted, both wanted our parents to be proud. Where, where do you think that desire came from? Was it watching their example and the, perhaps the diligence with which your father showed you how to disassemble and reassemble these mm -hmm. radios? What, where did the desire to please them come from if what you most received well, was continuous positive feedback? I'm not, I'm not sure it was the focus of my life was to please them. Right, or for them uh, to be proud. But I've, I've had from the time I was in grade school, maybe even in kindergarten or first grade, an overarching goal. 
And, and that is to live a life that matters, uh, to make a lasting positive difference in the world. I call it leaving footprints. And um, that's what drives me. So some people might say, well, my overarching goal is to be the richest person around. Or my overarching goal is to have a whole lot of adulation uh, and be a celebrity. My goal, uh, maybe even in a quiet way, uh, is to leave footprints on the world. Have there ever been times in your life where you felt like you've wandered or been pushed away from that and then have corrected course? I don't recall. <laughs> I don't recall. I, I, I've always sort of mar marched to my own drum. Yeah. You know, one of the, that's another uh, thing. Uh, and I th maybe this is important uh, f for uh, your audience. Um, I always wanted to be different. There are uh, people, particularly with social media these days, that want to be accepted, that want to be like others. Uh, if someone has a new kind of shoe or shirt, every you know, others want to have the same thing. And so I've always had a desire to be different from others. And maybe that uh, enables me not only to venture where others may not venture, but... Um, also to be satisfied uh, doing something that n nobody else is doing. Are there any books that have had a particularly large impact on your life or that you've given the most to other people or recommended? Well, the four-hour work week. <laughs> <laughs> or the four hour body. <laughs> you know, I've heard they're fine books. I've heard they're. <laughs> Those are very fine books, and everyone should read them. <laughs> Besides those, of course, <laughs> on the top shelf. Uh, are, are there are there any 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 books that come to mind that um, have impacted you strongly, or that you've recommended to students or other yeah. people? When uh, I was little. When I'm talking about little, like uh, six, eight, ten years old, there was a whole series of biographies written for children my age. Thomas Edison, Abraham Lincoln, Benjamin Franklin. And I would read those books over and over because they their lives and what they accomplished were what I hoped to do. So it was that set of experiences. There was a book uh, on the Wright brothers, uh, and these were written for somebody my age. Now you can uh, read Walter Isaacson's book on Benjamin Franklin or on Steve Jobs or Walter Isaacson's book on Einstein. And, uh, but it's the same thing. Yeah, or David McCullough's on the Wright Brothers. Yes. Yeah. A fabulous book. Do you still read biographies? Do you, is that... that that's oh. kind of all I care about. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, it's the stories the stories that uh, are inspirational. And it gets back to what we were talking about before with the case method, where when I'm reading a biography, just like I'm hoping the students, when they read a case, that they think of themselves in that situation and what would I do. And reading uh, uh, biographies, well, there's a wonderful McCullough book on the Wright brothers. Um, amazing lessons of, they didn't just go out, build a plane and fly it. <laughs> a lot of setbacks and uh, disappointments and struggles in order to do what they did. The same with, I mean, all of those. The, the, it gets to what we were talking about before, the 
preparation, the commitment to excellence, it doesn't happen overnight. People who achieve great things, even though it may look like uh, it happened uh, quickly and easily and everybody can do it, um, most of those stories have a lot of sacrifice and difficulty and disappointments and setbacks in them. For entrepreneurs, uh, whether students in your classes or people listening, are there any particular biographies or books that you would recommend in particular? Any, any standouts or, like, or just particular figures? Well, again, uh, don't buy the books because they um, have uh, lessons in them. Buy the books because they have stories in them. And there are a bunch of them. Um, my colleague uh, at Princeton, Derek Lidow, uh, has written uh, a couple of books, and the, his most recent is Built on Bedrock. And it's uh, uh, a, a lot of the book is about Walmart and Sam Walton and how it started. And he went to the Walmart archives and, and based his stories about Walmart on those facts. And, but it's, it's filled with stories about companies that were built by people on solid foundations, built on bedrock. I had a chance. You know, the stories are so important, I think, also uh, for, for, for many reasons, of course, but also because it's really the glue that we as humans are programmed to use to remember any of the lessons that might come out of those stories. And uh, that's something that struck me when a few months ago I, I was uh, invited to go to Bentonville, Arkansas, and interview Doug McMillan, the CEO of Walmart, uh -huh. uh, for this podcast. But it was my first time in Northwest Arkansas, my <laughs> first time in Bentonville, and I went to the I, I was able to see Sam Walton's pickup truck and the keys and the stories are what stick. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was a fascinating, fascinating experience. What are you most excited about these days? I mean, you're, you, you seem to be moving as quickly, doing as many things as ever. Uh, you certainly don't strike me as someone who's ever idle. What are you personally most excited about these days? Well, I'm focusing now on education, uh, and my years of teaching are just part of it. Um, but you look at higher education today, very expensive, a lot of students with debt uh, may not be prepared for first jobs. Um, may not be prepared for a lifetime of contributions. And so just in the last couple of weeks, I volunteered to be the interim president of a wonderful small college, Sierra Nevada College, uh, located in Incline Village, Nevada, right on the shores of Lake Tahoe in the uh, midst of the Sierra Nevada mountains. And um, this is a college that has uh, a dedicated faculty with real life experience in the areas they teach. Uh, they're not just teachers, they've done what they teach. Uh, it is a, a college in which entrepreneurship is pervasive. Uh, it uh, has some real focused uh, capabilities in environmental science. Well, right there on the shores of Lake Tahoe, keep Tahoe blue. Environmental science is critical uh, in that area. What a wonderful place to learn about that. It has uh, uh, a, a strong um, entrepreneurial-based business uh, program at the undergraduate level. And then it has a marvelous fine arts and creative writing uh, program. 
Um, you don't go there to major in neuroscience. <laughs> you don't go there to major in philosophy. But if you want to go to a, a small college with small classes with dedicated teachers and to be an entrepreneurial leader, both in your first job and for a lifetime of uh, contributions in uh, uh, establishing and, and building enterprises or uh, being a leading environmental scientist with entrepreneurial uh, approaches to that um, s scientific work. Or you, if you want to be like a writer, you know, Tim, better than anybody. Writers aren't just uh, writers. They're entrepreneurs. Yeah. <laughs> to creating content, but then getting their content uh, read. And podcasting... <laughs> That's a way of communicating with people. Um, I have friends who are photographers. They became photographers. They didn't born photographers, but they became photographers. But they're entrepreneurs. So here's a, a small college that I've volunteered to lead until a successor uh, with entrepreneurial leadership capabilities is identified and takes office and continue to um, promote this higher education approach. Uh, one of the uh, challenges these days, as I just mentioned, was how do we do this less expensively? And I believe that uh, there are ways in which education can use technology to um, reduce the costs. I'm not advocating, well, there will never be any more classrooms, but a combination of that classroom experience with online learning uh, can uh, reduce the uh, cost of providing a top-rated uh, uh, educational institution. Uh, I'm also uh, attracted to um, income sharing agreements. Perhaps your audience is not familiar with them, but rather than taking out student loans, there are sources of um, financing where the student uh, signs an agreement that to repay based on their income above certain levels. And if they never make that much, they don't repay, but if they make more than that threshold level, uh, then they uh, pay and may pay more than uh, the, the amount of the, the debt. But having uh, students graduating with huge amounts of debt r reduces their uh, choices. And you asked me earlier, well, how do you choose what you want to do? Well, I want to change the world. I want to do things that will benefit others. Well, if you have a lot of debt, you may not be able to make those choices that are in that direction. You have to focus first on, well, how do I make enough money to pay off my debt? So, and um, I don't know whether uh, any of the people who are listening to this podcast are thinking about enrolling in a, a unique educational institution, but we do have a few uh, openings left uh, for f entering freshmen this even this fall in late August. Uh, so if there are people who are interested in coming to a, uh, get a uniquely valuable educational experience in a beautiful setting, um, look up sierranevada.edu. <laughs> and I'll link to that in the show notes for everyone as well. So you'll be able to find those links really easily. Uh, the income sharing is, is very, very interesting to me. I, I don't have much exposure to it, but there are some programming schools, for instance. Uh, I believe one is called Lambda School, which has this exact model and has proven very, very successful. It also puts a very uh, productive onus on the educators to really think through the practicalities of what they're teaching yeah. and how effective they are. 
how effectively they're imparting these these skills to their yeah. students. Uh, Ed, do you have any particular quotes or m- mantras, anything that you live your life by or remind yourself of often? Are there any particular... I mean, you, you mentioned, uh, say, one earlier, if, if, if you're failing to prepare, you're preparing to fail. Mm. Do you have any other, any other quotes that have, have really stuck with you? Do what you enjoy doing. Do it the best you know how. Good things will happen. I love it. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I, I may be unusual. Well, I don't know whether I'm this unusual. Uh, I like to get out of my comfort zone do things I haven't done before. Uh, I believe that uh, doing so enables me to learn, but the more I learn, the more I'm able to contribute to others. So doing the same thing and and being able to be the best at that, uh, that's laudable, but... I, my mother had a problem with me when she was alive. She, uh, so I, I started out with this teaching. I mentioned how I got into it, the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And after I'd done that for a while, I said, Mom, um, I'm going to start a company. And she said, Buzzy, that was my nickname, and my sister still calls me Buzzy, and my high school friends call me Buzzy. Buzzy, you were just getting good at teaching, <laughs> and, and now you're going to start a company. You don't know anything about that. And then uh, the company did okay, and we took it public, and I said, Mother, uh, I'm going to run for Congress. Buzzy, you were just getting good at running a company. <laughs> you don't know anything about politics. <laughs> and... Um, she lived long enough so that she saw me sworn in to the U.S. House of Representatives in January of 1983, and then she passed away that April. Wow. How did she, how did she respond to seeing you sworn in? Uh, well, she, she was... Not um, she didn't express her emotions and her feelings a lot, but I, I believe she was proud. I'm sure she was. How could she not be? Yeah. You have a uh, an incredible tradition that I think is is so suiting to you and it's so memorable for so many of your students and uh, it has to do with singing and it seems like there have been a few different versions of this but uh, where did the singing enter the picture with your your teaching well it started way before that it started way before that oh yeah uh, when I was Probably in grade school, I would write poems about things like, The busy bee is lively, all he does is buzz, but yesterday he stung me, and now he is a was. <laughs> is, that, that's, is that something you wrote? <laughs> well, yeah, going <laughs> way back. And then uh, I started... Um, composing uh, or using music that already existed. Then um, when I was um, in first teaching at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, there, there was a tradition there where in the spring, in May, uh, they held a, a joint faculty student event called the Spring Fling. And uh, the faculty would prepare a skit. And um, it had perhaps uh, acting, it had perhaps some songs. And I became the writer for the uh, faculty skits. 
And then there were student skits as well. And uh, my f most famous song, I wrote many in, for those skits about various courses and, uh, well, primarily about courses. Uh, but then I'd also write the words, and we had a uh, takeoff on Batman and Robin, and we had uh, uh, a Mission Impossible skit and with, uh, where I'd write the songs and the music. And even after I left uh, the faculty they, uh, as a teacher, they kept, and I'd started my company, they kept me on the Stanford Business School faculty from the time I left, which was 1970, to 1981, so I could continue to be the writer of the faculty <laughs> skits. Well, the most famous song I wrote was uh, about the linear programming algorithm how to, it was called the simplex method, where uh, poor students in 1966, uh, when I was teaching the quantitative methods course, had to learn how to do this. And linear programming was uh, abbreviated LP, linear programming. And so I wrote a song about the algorithm that was mathematically correct, that if you listen to the words, uh, you could do the simplex algorithm to achieve an optimal solution to a linear programming problem. But I wrote it uh, in the form of a dance. <laughs> and uh, it went something like this. Come on, gang, now gather round. See what your math prof's putting down. Get in close and listen to me. I'm going to show you how to do the LP. It's a new dance, but it's easily done. In fact, you learned it in 261. Just to make sure that you can do it, listen close while I review it. Do the LP. Come on, baby, do the LP with me. We're going to pivot step day and night and optimize it out of sight. And then it went through a series of verses <laughs> with the details of the simplex algorithm. First of all, form a big strong line. Ah, that's it. You're looking fine. Fine behind that line. Form one more. Come on, everybody, get out on the floor. Keep forming lines one after one. When you're out of cats, then you're done. Now you see how I get my kicks. I've got y'all in a big matrix. Do the LP. Come on, baby, do the LP with me. We're going to pivot step day and night and optimize it out of sight. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> <laughs> so you you use stories you use music i i feel like i feel like uh these these are communication skills that sort of transcend transcend the era in which you were born i mean you could have gone back a thousand years and used these you could probably go forward a thousand years and use these and uh, your students remember these things. They really remember these things. And I'd love for you to talk about another song that I certainly was exposed to, and that is My Way, and why you chose that song. Well, uh, again, I was teaching at uh, Harvard Business School uh, in uh, 1996, a course called Entrepreneurial Finance, and um, for the last class of the course, I wanted to end with a, a number of stories and, and share with students my philosophies. And it was a captive audience. Attendance was mandatory. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I thought, uh, what would be an appropriate message to convey and um, that message, we've talked about it earlier, parenting, um, teaching, the message is just do it your way. And so then I thought of the song, My Way, and um, I put some words to that song 
This course is end is here, but I have in this final session a thought for your career. It is a most important lesson as you go down life's path. Whether slow or in a hurry, recall the Nike ad. Just do it your way. Ah, uh, it brings back the memories, and I and it not just it not only brings back the memories, but it it just refreshes the mark that you had on me and continue to have. And uh, I, I really just want to thank you, Ed, for doing things your way. It's really had such an incredible impact on so many people. And uh, I, I'm not going to mention him by name, but he's a mutual friend of ours. You introduced us because we were both, we were both students of yours. But I will, he's a very, very, very successful entrepreneur. And uh, we were going back and forth uh, emailing in preparation for this, this interview with you. And he, in closing says, please give my best to Ed. Any success I've had in business was due to him. That is an incredible sentence. And it's incredible also because he is not the only student who would write that. I've met students of yours from China. I've met students of yours from countries around the world who have some version of that sentiment. And it's so incredible. And it's been such a, a privilege and such a great stroke of luck that I ended up in your class. And I just want to say that to you because it's had such a significant impact on the trajectory of my life. And uh, certainly for me, that's a big deal. That's a really, yeah. really big deal. So well, I just wanted to thank you. You Thank you, Tim. And now you know why I do what I do. I've, I concluded a long time ago, I'm not going to be able to change the world alone. I said, my goal in life is to live a life that matters. I call it leaving footprints. But I can better achieve my goal leaving footprints with your feet. <laughs> and so that's why I do what I do. Well, Ed, I, I hope this is uh, certainly, I mean, I can't wait to have dinner. We're going to have dinner after this and continue to catch up. Uh, I can't wait to see what you do next. And uh, I'm uh, so, so happy to have a chance to spend time together today. And uh, this has been a real yeah. pleasure for me to do this. And well, I'm proud of you, Tim. And I'm proud of so many people who you refer to who have uh, taken my course. They've taken many other courses. They've had other experiences. But they go out and do great stuff. And deep down, I say to myself, well, I'm really glad I lost that Senate race. <laughs> <laughs> because otherwise I, I may not have been able to do what I've been doing. Yeah. Uh, I, I, it sounds strange to say, but I, I'm also glad. I'm really glad for my sake and for the sake of many people that you lost that Senate race. <laughs> and uh, you've just done so much, so much good. And uh, you're going to continue to do so much good. It's really inspiring. And uh, I think this is a great place to, to wrap up. Is there uh, anything else you would like to say or close with? Anything you'd like to recommend to people? Anything at all that you'd like to, to say before we wrap up? Well, I've told you my story. And with you know, some detail that, uh, based on Tim's questions. But... Uh, most important thing for you to do, you speaking to the audience, is to do it your way. Don't just follow what is recommended. Don't just um, pursue what others are pursuing. But do what 
you enjoy doing, do it the best you know how. Good things will happen. And if you're thinking more about doing something different than you're currently doing, it's time for a change. <laughs> Ken, I could not imagine a better place to close. Uh, Ed, to be continued, we're going to go grab some food and continue the conversation. But thank you so much for taking the time to yeah. do this. Oh, this is a, a real treat, Tim. And, and uh, oh, I noticed that there's a blackboard that's dirty and, and <laughs> erasers that need cleaning. There is. So, <laughs> so um, get to it. Yeah, there is literally a whiteboard right behind me. So I'm going to get get back to my 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 other tasks of cleaning up for Ed, and uh, to to be continued. And to everybody listening, uh, I will include everything we've talked about in the show notes. Uh, which you can find, as always, at tim.blog forward slash podcast. And uh, I, I hope you enjoyed this even half as much as I did. And thank you so much for tuning in. Hey, guys, this is Tim again. Just a few more things before you take off. Number one, this is Five Bullet Friday. Do you want to get a short email from me? Or would you enjoy getting a short email from me every Friday that provides a little morsel of fun before the weekend? And Five Bullet Friday is a very short email where I share the coolest things I've found or that I've been pondering over the week. That could include favorite new albums that I've discovered. It could include gizmos and gadgets and all sorts of weird shit that I've somehow dug up in the, uh, the world of the esoteric as I do. It could include favorite articles that I've read and that I've shared with my close friends, for instance. And it's very short. It's just a little tiny bite of goodness before you head off for the weekend. So if you want to receive that, check it out. Just go to fourhourworkweek.com. That's fourhourworkweek.com, all spelled out. And just drop in your email and you will get the very next one. And if you sign up, I hope you enjoy it. This episode of The Tim Ferriss Show is brought to you by 99designs. 99designs is a global creative platform that makes it easy for you to find an amazing designer and create designs you'll love. From logos to branding to packaging to books, you name it, they have it. And I've used them for just about everything. 99designs is the go-to creative resource for any budget. I've used them for years now for book covers, for instance, mock-ups of The 4-Hour Body, which went on to become a number one New York Times bestseller, illustrations for the multi-volume Tao of Seneca, including the cover, and many other creative projects. I've been very impressed by the quality of their work. Most recently, I used 99designs to update the illustrations and layout of my 5 Morning Rituals ebook. The illustrations worked out great, I loved working with the designer we selected, and I plan to work with him on more projects in the future, and that's something you can do. You don't have to start from scratch every time. And right now, my listeners can get $20 off plus a free $99 upgrade on their first design contest. Simply submit a brief on the site describing what you need, and designers who are interested in your project, often from around the world, will submit concepts for you to choose from. You refine as you go, give feedback, and once you're ready, you choose one to finalize. It's a great way to get started and find the right match. A great designer and a great design at a great price. So head to 99designs.com forward slash Tim to learn more or get started today. You can also see examples of some of the work that I have done with designers on 99designs. So check it out, 99designs.com forward slash Tim. This episode is brought to you by Peloton. I love Peloton. Peloton is a cutting edge indoor cycling bike that brings live studio classes right to your home. You don't have to worry about fitting classes into your schedule, making it to the studio, or dealing with some commute to the gym. I have a Peloton bike in my master bedroom at home, and it is one of the first things that I do in the morning. I wake up, meditate for 20 minutes, and then I knock out a short 20 minute ride, usually high intensity interval training or kit. Then I take a shower and I'm in higher gear for the rest of the day. It's beautifully convenient and has become something that I actually look forward to. And I was skeptical in the beginning. I didn't think I would dig it. And I really do. So you have a lot of options. For one, if you like, you can ride live with thousands of other Peloton riders from across the country on the interactive leaderboard to keep you motivated. I tend to use a lot of the classes on demand and have four to six of them that I've bookmarked and use over and over again. There are up to 14 new classes every day with thousands of classes on demand and there are a variety of workouts to choose from. 45 minute classes, 20 minute burns, hip hop, rock and roll, low impact or high intensity. Pick the class structure and style that works for you. 
Peloton has an amazing roster of incredible instructors in New York City. They really do have great instructors of every possible personality and style. And you can find one that you love, no matter what you're in the mood for. Personally, I use Matt Wilpers a lot, but I use a bunch of them. I'm promiscuous and enjoy classes from a lot of their instructors. With real-time metrics, you can track your performance over time and continue to beat your personal best. I did not think the gamification would work for me, and uh, they really hit the nail on the head. It does work, at least for me, tremendously well to keep me pushing consistently. So, discover this cutting-edge indoor cycling bike that brings the studio experience to your home. Peloton is offering listeners of this podcast a limited-time offer. Go to onepeloton.com, that's spelled O-N-E-P-E-L-O-T-O-N.com, Enter the code TIMPODCAST, all one word, at checkout and get $100 off accessories with your Peloton bike purchase. Get a great workout at home anytime you want. Go to OnePeloton.com and use the code TIMPODCAST to get started.